All right? So the rest of you are, are worse partners than we are. Take a long, hard look at yourselves, all right? And Emma, do you see how well you've done, hey? I mean, I wasn't happy about it, but I, st I shared anyway. Right. Now, to get your attention back, what we need to do is come up with something that will actually capture your imagination. We're going to give away a $100 voucher thanks to the Invercargill Licensing Trust right now. Are we happy? Are we ready? Are we listening? So this will actually take you to listen. I'm sorry about that. I know you haven't the whole night, but if it's just for this period here, it's worth your while. So what we're going to do now, we've got uh, 40 tables. So you can see here, I don't know if you can, uh, if you can zoom in. So this is all very uh, above board. I put a random generator on my phone here. So what we're going to do is we'll come up with a random table number. Okay, so you need to shriek and holler because someone on this table that I randomly select is going to win a $100 Invercargill Licensing Trust voucher. Are we ready? Are we listening? The number is 29. You are not 29, Bellew. Where are, where's 29? We're over here, number 29. Fantastic. Let's go visit table number 29. So the rest of you have to live vicariously through table 29, I'm afraid. Where are we? That's 27. 29, who have we got here? Are they, are these are the football boys. Yeah. Queen's Park Football Club, folks. Right, oh, good stuff. I'm pleased, mate. You've been having a good night. Right. No, calm, calm. Okay, and this is where you need to stay with me. How many people have we got at this table? Have you oversubscribed here? Ten. Eleven is the number. Righto, you need to... Good stuff, mate. Okay, I got you. don't have to mansplain how the, how the table works. It's okay. What we're going to do is we're going to count you around the table one to eleven, all right? Because one of you is going to win a hundred bucks. I don't think, mate, I'm going to take you out. You don't need a hundred dollar ILT voucher, to be fair. All right, so let's... Let's count you off, Jen. You can start. You're one, you're two. See how this works? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll put old mate in there, so there's 11. Are you ready? The lucky number is seven. Who's number seven? Thank you, madam. Now, the great news is I've left the prize up on the uh, podium. We'll bring it down to you. Well done. I'm pleased that's a winner. What's your name? Helen has won it from Queen's Park Football Club. Thank you, Helen. There we go. Yeah, well done. Queen's guys. Park for life. There we go. Uh, who in this room, I'm sorry, I need to, somebody to take some responsibility. Uh, who put Queen's Park uh, footy over near the bar? Because I feel like that's a big move. All right. Great job, Nick. Well done, you. Well, it's the random numbers. What it do is. we do? I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, while we settle back in, let's talk about our third unsung hero nominee and of course these are people who have made a massive difference in our community and so our third nominee for the unsung hero award is William Implemans <laughs> the late William Implemans was only a member of the Southland Mountain Bike Club for a short period, but his impact on the sport will be long-lasting. Will spent hundreds of volunteer hours working on the Bluff Hill Motsapohi mountain bike tracks, often by himself and unknown to the club and his partner. <laughs> He's also actively worked with uh, young riders, coaching and guiding them on uh, mountain bike experiences around Southland and Otago. He spent many weekends uh, shuttling them up to the top of uh, Bluff Hill and in 2021, uh, William was named the Southland Mountain Bike Club's Volunteer of the Year for his dedicated work. So it's another uh, great story uh, for the public to have voted on over recent weeks and uh, certainly a tough year uh, again for this uh, category. But how about we uh, give it up for the late William Implements. Right now, aside from dessert, I've been looking forward to this most for this evening. Uh, like most of us in this room, our guest speaker tonight dabbled in many sports when she was younger. Rugby, touch, netball, basketball. These were the sports she loved and participated in regularly. As we'll find out tonight, uh, though her life changed in uh, 2016, uh, she then made the switch to snow sports and is now aiming to be the first female sit skier to represent Aotearoa New Zealand at the 2026 Winter Paralympics in Italy.
It is indeed a story of grit, determination, and of an athlete who is destined to succeed. No pressure. Uh, but you're not here to listen to us tell this inspiring story. Please welcome to the stage. Here she is, skier, Bailey Unahi. <laughs> There we go. Um, yes, so I'm Bailey, and yeah, I grew up just down the road in Winton, um, attending St Thomas's and Central Southland College, where I was, you know, sporting was a huge part of my life. Um, my life didn't get very interesting, I guess, until um, my second year of university. I was um, studying a Bachelor of Science two weeks into the year. It was a Friday, and this is the day that my life changed forever. So I was with my rugby team, the varsity rugby team, and we were doing a flat crawl just around Dunedin. And yeah, the, all of these decisions was leading up to, I guess, the biggest, biggest moment of my life where I was at the 660 concert and talking away, um, didn't even realise what was above me. And then I heard this loud noise from above. And then before I even had a chance to realise what it was or even look down or move, um, the weight of a balcony and about 20 people was uh, crushing me, landed on my shoulder, and yeah, I, that was when I um, crushed uh, T3, T5 uh, vertebrae, my T12, L1 vertebrae, and that's where the damage to my spinal cord happened. At the time, I didn't realise. I was just in a lot of pain, um, and wondering why is no one telling me to put my legs down, I thought they were floating. Um, and then I went to Dunedin Hospital, where they did a CT scan and found all these fractures and um, broke quite a few of my uh, ribs as well, because it came down onto my shoulder. And yeah, I guess it was just an unlucky spot for me to be standing in, because I'm not a tall person, I don't really know how you know, I got the brunt of it all, but yeah, I spent... I ended up getting told I was going in a helicopter, which I was very excited about. Um, you know, not that I could see anything. I was pretty gutted when it was just black. It was the middle of the night. Um, and I was, I was stoked. Uh, anyway, and then went up to Christchurch, and that's when I kind of started my five-month journey at uh, Burwood Hospital. Um, but here's a wee video of, I guess, the incident. We like just arrived, and then there's just a loud noise from above. I was just crushed by the, the weight of the balcony and everyone on it. I was at least two hours until I was in, in the hospital. I just felt real guilty, like I just felt like I'd done something wrong, you know, like I shouldn't have should have been there. Um, and on the side, there's the X-ray of, of my fracture where it severed my uh, spinal cord. Um, and I had no idea what a spinal cord injury was or what that involved. Um, and yeah, so I got flown to Christchurch, as I said earlier. Um, they did a surgery where they stabilised my spine with um, rods and screws. And I was told, you know, the surgery went really well. You know, you know we couldn't really ask for more. And then, so that was on, the, so Friday was the day it happened, had the surgery on the Saturday, and then on Sunday, I decided to go back onto my Facebook and I was, you know, scrolling, scrolling on my news feed and I came across an article. And the article um, is where I found out I would never walk again because I hadn't actually been told by the health professionals, they told my parents, but yeah, I had no idea that was the reality of the, um, the injuries, so, not an ideal way, and I guess it's just it's a good story for everyone else. So everyone else got to find out before me, which wasn't really ideal. Um, yeah, so that was the start, and then I was transferred over to Burwood, which is a spinal um, rehab ward. And basically, I was like a newborn baby, learning how to do everything in life again, just in a different way, um, which was quite a contrast to you know a few weeks earlier where... I was living independently in a three-storey flat with my friends, um, partying, going to uni, playing rugby, all these things I just took for granted. So it was definitely a new perspective, and I realised, you know, at the, at the time I was lying in hospital and I was thinking, like, I felt guilty, first of all, and then second of all, I felt like 
I had so many regrets, like why didn't I do this, why did I put this off? Because we so often think that we have forever, you know, we always have tomorrow um, to do, you know, to go travelling, to go do that hike or you know, do whatever, basically. You just, you just take your function for granted. Um, so that was a huge learning curve. Um, and I also had no idea how do you do life as a wheelchair user. Um, and also, I always thought, you know, using a wheelchair was such a negative thing because that's the way um, society kind of frames it. Um, like, oh, poor you, you're in a wheelchair. And when I was in hospital, I was you know, stuck in a hospital bed for quite some time until I could kind of get everything right and my blood pressure was all over the place. And when I finally was able to, you know, use a wheelchair, like, it was the most exciting thing because I had the independence back. I could get from A to B. Um, you know, I didn't have to ask to be pushed around and, yeah, it was so exciting. So it's quite interesting that even, you know, I'm guilty of it as well. Like, I had that thought, like, oh, like, wheelchair must be hard and there's a lot more to it than um, what's on the surface. Like, yes, I can't um, move my legs, that's why I use a wheelchair, but I also can't feel my legs and everyone's different, but, like, <laughs> a few of the things that happens, uh, what's happened after is because I don't feel... Um, I've leant up against an oven, I had the oven door open, and I just had it resting on my knee. I didn't even realise, you know, I carried on for the day, and I looked down, and there was this huge, huge, like, burn blister on my knee, and my sister was freaking out. So I just went outside, had the hose on it, was fine. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, like, if I could feel, like, I wouldn't have had it, but then, I mean, I'm glad I can't feel, because it didn't hurt. Um, and a few other times, like, when I... Um, Oh, it really, I think it still happens now. I get this really like swollen ankle. It looks really bad. And I thought I'd done something, like twisted it when I was transferring. So I went to the hospital, went to Dunedin Hospital, and um, I was like, oh, I think there's something wrong. They're like, well, does it hurt? I was like, no, but like, this, look at it. She's like, oh, well, if it doesn't hurt, why are you here? I was like, it <laughs> looks pretty bad. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of big changes, but, you know, I had a lot of support around me. Like, my family and friends were awesome. and every day I had visitors and, you know, kept my spirits high and I just, you know, got on with it. But um, I learned a lot. I didn't realise you could drive. Um, up there in the top left um, corner, there's a photo of me and a wee red driving simulation set up. And so now I drive with hand controls and there's a video later where I'll kind of show you how that works. But um, it was pretty pretty crazy of Burwood. They... Um, they were like, yep, just jump in here, do this, turn the wheel a few times, and then they put me in the car. I was on a lot of drugs. Uh, <laughs> and went for a drive, and then I was like, yep, I can't use my legs to, to brake. I wanted to, really wanted to push down. Um, but when I realised you couldn't do that, you just use your hand instead, and was driving ever since. Had a wee rental car um, up there, and then got my own car, which has given me a lot of independence, getting from A to B. Um, which is pretty awesome. Um, and in the bottom bottom corner is a photo of me um, getting on the plane. And I had no idea. I was like, you know, I'm never going to travel again. You know, all of these kind of beliefs and things that kind of come up when you first get injured. But, you know, I'd never seen someone sitting in a wheelchair on a plane, so I just thought, oh, well, they mustn't be able to, to fly. But um, what happens is you generally get onto this aisle chair that's designed to go down... Um, or fit in between the aisles of the aircraft and then just transfer on. And there's like a wee cherry picker there. Um, a little bit fancier these days, but essentially that's, that's the um, reality of it. And I get on first. So <laughs> that's the issue, is I get on first and generally they put me as um, on the aisle seat. So if anyone's beside me, they'll come up and, you know, usually the courteous thing to do would be stand up and, you know, use your seat. <laughs> And they look at me and they're like, you're going to stand up? I'm like, oh, like, sorry, sorry, like, I actually can't. And they go, oh, OK, are you sure? And I'm like, no, nah, like, <laughs> I actually can't. And then they go, oh, OK. And then so I'm sitting there, you know, do the whole flight thing. And then the same thing happens at the end of the flight. I get off last and once everyone's out. Because it must take too long, apparently, to get off. But um, that's just the protocol. Anyway, they're like, oh, well, I'll wait for you to go. I'm like, no, seriously, like, I have to wait till every single person's off the plane. They go, no, no, I'll wait, I'll wait. Half the planes off are getting off. He's like, oh, okay, no, actually, I'll get off. <laughs> Climb over me. Um, but yeah, flying's pretty easy. Like, I just got back from Australia, um, so it definitely is a possibility. Um, don't ask about uh, hitting the kangaroo in the rental car, but you know, 
it, it happens. Um, but yeah, air, air flying is usually pretty good and you get treated pretty well, um, apart from when they lose your wheelchair. So <laughs> that's always fun. And then you get up and then you go, where's my wheelchair? And they go, oh, do you have one? I'm like, yes, like, hence, <laughs> hence the aisle seat. So I've had that happen a few times, so it's not ideal. Um, grocery shopping, that's kind of a random thing. Pretty good. Um, a lot of stares from little kids, which is quite funny. Um, and they're just wide-eyed thinking, how does she have her bike in the, in the, in the grocery shop, Mum? <laughs> and they're looking at me, looking at me, so I'll pop a wheelie just to kind of, you know, get a reaction. <laughs> and then one time, um, one of the little kids said to their mum, Mum, I want one of those. And the mum's face was horrified. She's like, no, you don't, no, you don't, shut up. <laughs> but it's quite funny. Kids are, kids are pretty funny. And I think it's, like, the best thing to go about it would just be, like, if they're interested, just ask. Like, when people kind of grab their kid and pull them out of the way, which actually happens quite a lot, it makes them kind of scared because it's the unknown, they're interested. But when they do that, you're kind of instilling f a fear into people. A um, couple other funny things was, like, going through doors and, you know, I'd be like a big on a two metre sliding door and the person would come in and stop. What, you can come through and like, there's so much room, like you can carry on too. And it's like, you haven't done anything, you're not holding the door open, it's automatic. <laughs> but people just get such a shock, you know, that, that, that's quite funny. But yeah, I've pretty much learned how to do life again just from sitting, um, which is quite good, you know, always got a chair. Um, although a few times, a few times I've been to the movies and, um, I'm not much of, I'm not very organised, so I don't plan ahead and ring up and ask for the, you know, the wheelchair seat or the spot where you can actually access the, um, the seats from a wheelchair. And uh, all the, pretty much all the seats in the, in the cinema were, um, were full, uh, were empty, except the back row, which is the only ones I could um, access. So I was like, oh, excuse me, like, would you mind, I was with like four or five of my friends, I was like, oh, excuse me, would you mind like going to the, to the row in front, like the exact same spot, just one row in front. Um, absolutely not. <laughs> Stopped her feet. No, I'm not moving. I came here early. I was like, I literally cannot get like down these stairs to get to the seat. Um, or a few other times where they go, oh, well, you can't you just sit in the sit in your wheelchair while you watch the movie? I was like, I paid for a seat. Like, <laughs> you don't come to a movie and expect to be standing, you know, at the movie, th you know, for two or three hours. Um, so yeah, so I'm the same but different. Um, obviously do everything sitting. So about eight months after my accident, I came home and I actually got to go to Outward Bound in Anakiwa. So it was an Activate course, which is for people with disabilities. Um, pretty much the same as like the big 28 day course, but just condensed down to eight days. And this was quite eye opening for me. Um, Cause again, I was living in a you know, bubble in, in hospital and pretty much thinking, well, everyone was running around after me, which was quite good, but um, I had a lot of kind of self-limiting beliefs, thinking, oh, I won't be able to do that, or oh, I can't do that. But yeah, we jumped in the deep end, and you know, every day we were up early, we were like, jam-packed, we went camping, we went kayaking, we went sailing. Um, quite funny, this photo, I mean, it looks lovely, but the reality was there was no wind, so we were um, paddling, and I don't really have much balance, and it's just like a, um, like a, like a bench seat, and so what they did was they put a picnic chair on top of it, tied it, you know, tied it up with a rope. I got onto the picnic chair, and they tied my life jacket to the to the chair with a little bit of room so that you could go forward and and paddle and then go back, and you know you weren't going to fall out. So you know we made it work. It was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, that's when I realised actually you can do everything, especially when you have you know the right people around you with a good attitude and and, you know, adapting, you know, with equipment and, and whatnot. So, yeah, when I came back, I decided to um, go back to Dunedin. Didn't really want to do Bachelor of Science anymore, so I changed to um, Occupational Therapy, which I didn't even know what that was until I needed an Occupational Therapist. Um, so I went back to Dunedin, and there well, I had some pretty interesting um, experiences because, obviously, I lived my life 19 years able-bodied and going through school and stuff, I, you know, I'm still the same person like, as I always was, but obviously to the outside I'm someone in a wheelchair. And me and my friends still want to do the same things that we were, you know, doing before my injury, so we go out, go out drinking and to the clubs and things, and I'd be in the club and someone would come up to our group of friends and be looking at my friends saying, 
your friend, she has to leave, she's a fire hazard. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm not more flammable than anyone else here. <laughs> but <laughs> they wouldn't talk to me, which was the worst thing. They would talk to my friends and my friends were like, don't talk to me, like, talk to her. So yeah, a lot of a lot of discrimination. A lot of times, like people would use like the accessible bathrooms as like storage. So they'll build up, you know, just chuck everything in there. And you want to go to the toilet, and you can't, you know. So it was quite frustrating, and you know, even realizing um, that you know the, the world is not built for you. So even my family home where I'd been living wasn't accessible. My flat that I was living with my friends wasn't accessible, and it's just like, oh my god, I'm not going to be able to, you know be a part of kind of society, but my friends are awesome. We figured out ways to get me in, like without, you know, either take a ramp or, like Jesus, before I had ramps, I would just either shuffle up or pull myself up in the wheelchair, which was pretty nice of them. They got pretty good at it. Um, so yeah, we just had to adapt because um, I still wanted to do everything probably more than what I was doing beforehand. Um, got into camping recently, so I got myself a wee set up, as you can see in one of those photos. Um, so I'm quite stubborn. I want to be able to do everything myself. So the swag is quite good because it's nice and low, so I can just get in the ground and set it all up. Um, and, yeah, so I've been to a few different places. That was when we were at um, Skipper's Canyon, which is pretty awesome. Very cold. <laughs> Would not recommend uh, in April. Um, and then kayaking, quite into kayaking as well because, obviously, you don't need your legs to go kayaking. So do a bit of kayaking, which was pretty awesome. Um, but <laughs> the reality is, on rivers, they get, get quite shallow, and then you get stuck on the um, gravel. So I've had a few times that that's happened, but luckily I've been with people, so I've just dragged me along. Um, but yeah, life is full of adventures. This is a wee video of my, this is my old car, actually. Um, and I've got a robot, which I'm quite lucky to have. So basically, it's in the boot, comes out, brings my wheelchair out right to my door, and then goes back into the boot. So it saves me a lot of effort, um, and it's quite quite cool. Everyone says, and oh my god, what's that? Like, yeah, you know, I was here just drive with my hand controls. Don't know if I show you that, but yeah, I can drive my car normally as well. It's just linked up to the brake and accelerator. We hit to one. Oh. Too soon. Uh, so, I guess a lot of you um, will know how important sport is to everyone here. Um, you know, growing up, it was a huge part of my life. What I did during school, what I did after school, what I did during the weekends. You know, and it was a variety of different sports, and that's kind of a part of a huge part of my identity. But you know, who my friends were. Um, you know, fitness and like an outlet, and it was just you know a huge part of my life. And then. When I had my accident, I had no idea what sport was available. And to be fair, when I did find out what there was, there's not a whole lot, um, which is pretty frustrating, especially for like a social, um, a social aspect. You know, there's a lot of, I'm at a time where a lot of people playing even just social sport and not even being able to join in can be pretty, pretty tough. But um, I mean, I went back to Dunedin, I got involved with Parafet Otago, and they had wheelchair basketball, which was pretty cool. Um, but it just wasn't as organised and structured as kind of the trainings I had in the past with, you know, like regular warm-ups and skills and getting better and competitions and all that kind of stuff. So at the end of the year, we ended up going to, this is 2017, ended up going to um, Wanaka for the weekend and they'd organise the transport, accommodation, lift passes, lessons, all that kind of stuff. So I thought, why not a weekend in, in Wanaka? What could go wrong? I mean, I couldn't ski before with two legs, but we'll give it a go, paralysed. <laughs> and um, it was an experience, because basically, um, in the video I'll show you a bit about it, but basically you're sitting in like a bucket, is what they call it, um, like a plastic kind of seat with some straps at your hips, straps at your knees, straps on your shins, straps on your um, feet, and you're on like a, kind of like a titanium frame, and it's got motorci motorcycle suspension, and then you have two little like crutch things called outriggers, and they have like a piece of string that you pull up. Sounds quite cheap, but very expensive. These are fourteen thousand dollars for the sit ski. Um, pull this wee string up to um, either put the skis down into ski mode or bring them back up to walk mode. So you use them to you know lift yourself up to get on the chairlifts, to get around on like the flat snow, or if you fall over, which I did a lot of. Um, 
but yeah, going out in the mountain and actually having that freedom, leaving the wheelchair behind in the, um, just, just leave it in the middle of, of the um, courtyard area. Everyone's like, why is there like five different wheelchairs just sitting there? But um, yeah, getting out in the mountain, going fast, going with your friends was awesome. Um, and it was, I guess I got to the point where I was used to failing. Like, I think as an adult, as you get older, you get scared to fail because it's embarrassing or, or whatever it is, or you don't want to look silly in front of your friends. But I'd got pretty used to failing at, you know, the most simple tasks. So um, skiing was not really a big deal for me. I was pretty keen to be independent on the mountain and seeing those um, like kind of professional or independent set of skiers on the mountain was pretty cool. Um, so then I got involved in that and kind of just kind of got a taste of the adrenaline and, and all that had to offer and the community and the opportunity to go overseas to get better, to um, meet friends and potentially now hopefully meet, uh, represent New Zealand at um, the next Winter Olympics, uh, Paralympics, sorry. Um, so I'm in the Development High Performance Sport New Zealand and Snow Sports New Zealand pathway. So hoping to do back-to-back -back winters for the next four years and training and um, competing to get to that point. Um, and here's a wee video on um, Crowd Grows Wild, just a bit about that. We head to Wanaka now to hear the story of a remarkable woman whose life was changed four years ago when a balcony collapsed on her at a 660 gig in Dunedin. 23-year-old Bailey Unahi has set her sights on representing New Zealand at the Para Winter Olympics. ACC has helped her along the way and captured this amazing story. Four years ago, Bailey Unahi was just like any other first year Otago <laughs> student. Until the decision to call into this 660 gig changed her life forever. There was a loud noise that came above and then yeah, it crushed me, the balcony with all the people on it. It was really sore. My legs felt like they were floating. I didn't realise my spinal cord was severed. Not that she was aware at the time just how bad it really was. It wasn't really until I come across a news article the day after my surgery and read that um, I'll never walk again. She Didn't may never it. walk again, <laughs> but she's now carving herself a new path, one that's a lot faster than walking anyway. In 2017, I was involved with Parafet Otago when I was living in Dunedin, and then they invited me to come along on a um, snow sports weekend. So I came up and had a lesson. It was good fun being up in the mountain and like you just feel normal, like you're just having fun, you're just skiing like the mountain like everyone else. You've got that freedom when you're out in the mountain. And that newfound freedom has led Bailey to set some big goals. Ideally the long term goal would be to go to the Paralympic Games. It's pretty awesome to be able to represent New Zealand and you know, small town Winton and you know, females would be pretty cool. Yeah, just keep doing the things that I enjoy, trying new sports and yeah, making cool memories. The alternative to, you know, not trying anything is, well, you just live in the same life, you know, you may as well give it a go and if you like it, it's another thing that you can do. Life's too short, you don't know what's around the corner and, you know, make the most of now. Well, that's a serious dose of inspiration. Anna Wilcox, Crowd Goes Wild. What a legend, good on you, Bailey. We'll Shot follow Bailey. you in your career. So yeah, that's kind of a visual for my terrible description earlier. Um, so yeah, that is my big passion at the moment. I've also got myself like an adaptive wakeboard. Um, it's quite a similar setup to the sit ski, um, except a little bit lower and then obviously mounted onto a wakeboard. Haven't managed to get it up yet. I just, I bought it off someone that hadn't used it and then <laughs> went down to the lake and jumped in it and yeah, I just kept tipping over. But we'll, we'll figure out a way, I'm pretty keen to to get onto that would be quite cool to, to transfer into into summer and another adrenaline sport as well. So thank you all for having me. I hope you've learned a bit about well, my life with a spinal cord injury and um, hopefully not so scared of people when you see them in a wheelchair in a supermarket or something like that. So if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. And this is where you can find me um, on Instagram probably the most active, although not the active as well, but yeah, thank you. How good.
Talk about blowing up uh, preconceptions, eh? Let's uh, give her a, a, a big round of applause. applause. <laughs> Bailey Unahy. Plus, anyone who can use the sentence, I've got a robot, is pretty kick-ass in my idea. <laughs> I do have one question, though. What about the kangaroo in the rental car? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, just came out of nowhere. We're in the city centre. Um, yeah, that was a great start to the holiday. That's what the kangaroo <laughs> said as well. Yep. We didn't get a winner statement, but that's what the kangaroo said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. I think you're off the hook. Perfect. That was amazing. Now we'll try to get down this ramp. Yeah. Oh, good. Just hang out with us. We, we've got nowhere else to be tonight. Thanks, Bailey. That's, uh, that's awesome stuff. And uh, certainly I know that uh, you'll join us in uh, uh, wishing you all the best for uh, your uh, bid for uh, the uh, Paralympics and uh, gold as well. So uh, be outstanding to uh, watch her up uh, on those Italian slopes. Give her a big round of applause, folks. It seems appropriate then that we go from one hero to another. It is time for the fourth and final Southland Times People's Choice Unsung Heroes Award finalist. And let's uh, showcase the Nightcaps golf team. Great story this. Six years ago, the 100-year-old Nightcaps Golf Club was facing the prospect of closure with just seven playing members at that time. Fast forward now to 2022, and the club is uh, now home to one of Southland's more remarkable sporting dynasties. In August of 2016, Nightcaps challenged Winton for the Lang Shield, which is the symbol of male golfing supremacy in Southland, and won. Six years on, and the club still holds the shield, defending it on 58 occasions. More importantly, there's no longer talk of closing the Nightcaps course, with club captain Stu Dobby certain the fairy tale Lang Shield tenure has helped save the club. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nightcaps golf team. Good stuff. So that's the four, right? We've gone through that's them all. Yep, so four yep. outstanding and, uh, as you can tell, we're the uh, finalists as well. And we will have uh, the winner's announcement uh, shortly for you there. All right, uh, first, though, we've got our next of our uh, categories to get into. And this one is the Rico Southland Coach of the Year. Of course, it's the uh, coach's job to do all the things uh, to their athlete, right? Uh, this is the crucial role across all sports, whether individual or team, and the hours of guidance, expert advice, and occasional uh, home truths. Uh, cannot be underestimated. To present and tell us about this year's award, it is our pleasure to welcome back again this year a man who, like any good coach, always has some advice at the ready, the Managing Director of Rico Southland, Rhys McDonald. Thank you, uh, Angie and Nick. Look, I, I, I think I always get the worst slot of the night. Who wants to follow up after that tonight? Uh, that was so inspirational, Bailey. Um, something that I can share with you though, Bailey, you travelled at night in the helicopter. I'd travelled during the day and you'd seen the sky. So you missed out on nothing, really. <laughs> um, hey, look, it is, it is awesome for Rico Southam to be able to sponsor the coach of the year. It's, it's the coach that I think is so important but has the worst job. Because when the team's not going well, we will blame the coach. So, so look, all the coaches out there, and, and the coaches actually are mums and dads. We're all being a coach to somebody at, at some point during our during our lives. It's our kids. It's 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 the kids' friends. Um, so, so look, I'm I'm really privileged that Rico Southland get to do this. So, uh, and I also want to just make mention. I I had a chat with my wife tonight. Um, love, I didn't write my speech. She does it every year, but, but I do want to make special mention that I think it's 11 years for, for me in sport and in, in active south, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, 11 years being part of it. So how awesome is this that, that I've been allowed to be part of this event for, for 11 years? So thank you to uh, Active Southland and the team. And, and also on a, on a more personal note too, I've, I've worked with Brendan for a long time. It's going to be different, but uh, I'm really pleased that he's chosen to work right next door to me. So <laughs> Be awesome, but uh, yeah. Without wasting too much more time, let's let's see these awesome coaches that uh, have been nominated for Rico Southern Coach of the Year. Following the off-season departure of co-captain Gina Crampton, and with five players under the age of 21, few experts had the 2021 Southern Steel amongst their favourites to make the playoffs. 
but Rainha Bloxham was able to mould a team which would go all the way to hosting the elimination final. A local hero, Rainha Bloxham. An ever-present figure court size at ILT Stadium Southland, Leighton Haddleton is a nationally recognised basketball coach. The Southland Sharks assistant coach has been selected as head coach of the New Zealand Under-17 boys team ahead of their World Cup event in 2024. Helping create hoop dreams for our best young players, Leighton Haddleton. Considered one of the top athletics coaches in the country, the unassuming Chris Knight watched proudly as four of his charges claimed a total of five medals at the New Zealand Track and Field Champs in Hastings earlier this year. His younger athletes also performed well on their home track at the Colgate Games. Building talented young athletes, Chris Knight. Queen's Park has been a dominant force in Southland football for the past two seasons, thanks in no small part to Paddy Murphy. The Southland Football Coach of the Year led his team to an unbeaten Donald Gray campaign in 2021 and was part of the move to step up to the Southern Men's Premier League in 2022. A part of football history, Paddy Murphy. Uh, with a fantastic crew up there, so great to see a lot of amazing people in Southland and, and congratulations to all finalists. But tonight's uh, winner of the Rico Southland Coach of the Year Award is Chris Knight. <laughs> I know that you love this public speaking malarkey, don't you, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk this through. Four athletes, five medals. Is Hastings now your favourite place in the world? No, Southland is. Okay, that's, what, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> and Hastings. No, kidding. Um, what were your expectations going into that meet? That's a fantastic result. Um, well, given that our season was so disrupted with COVID, um, it's really hard to motivate athletes when they've got nothing to look forward to because everything's taken away from them. Um, so we went in reasonably confident um, and my job as a coach is to keep them relaxed and let them do their thing um, and just give them the confidence to go out there and do it. And that's what I do. Well, you clearly do it well, too. It is hard. You do need to, you know, training, being the athlete that I am, uh, training does rely on that end date and, you know, you're, you're tapering, you're doing all sorts of things, you know, you're peaking at the right time. So what did you do over that time? Well, I mean, Nationals were reasonably lucky. Athletics in New Zealand did a superb job in coming up with an event that could operate under the COVID restrictions that we had did mean that there were no spectators. Um, only coaches and team managers were allowed inside the venue, um, which is disappointing for the athletes. Um, so it made my role even more important. Um, you know, we, we prepared like any other competition. You know, before Christmas, the athletes were preparing for the secondary school nationals. And, you know, a month out, they got cancelled. So you just have to regroup and just prepare like you normally would as if everything's happening because it could be the last day before the event that it actually gets cancelled. Um, so you can't plan for that. You've just got to plan for being there on the day to perform. And that's when the psychology comes in, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> and being the shoulder to cry on sometimes. Uh, speaking of events, and, and yes, that one went really well. Let's touch on the Colgate Games, though, because that was huge and hugely successful. That was a fantastic event. Um, my guys actually surprised me with how well they did. You know, we had nearly 900 kids from around the country come down for that event. 
from as far up as Northland and uh, of course Invercargill, lots of Invercargill kids which is really good. Um, fantastic weather, oh. probably had the three best days in, in the Southland summer. Actually had to have a sprinkler to call the kids down after their events, um, which is unheard of, <laughs> even in the North Island. Um, so, you know, it was a fantastic event and, you know, one of my kids came away with six gold medals, three in events that he had never, tr never done before. So it was pretty outstanding. It's an all-rounder there for you. Uh, now, what this very humble gentleman beside me will not tell you is that after all of these things, these Colgate Games, all of these big meets, they do a satisfaction survey. And Invercargill got 100% satisfaction for what they delivered, and this man played a massive part of that. So I'm sorry, the secret's out. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, this is our 2022 Rico Southland Coach of the Year. Thank you. Good stuff, Chris, and uh, thanks as always, uh, Reese. Well done. All right, uh, we'll keep things uh, tracking along because we'll move straight into our uh, next uh, category that we have uh, for you now. And uh, this next award celebrates the camaraderie, the accountability, and the joy of achieving cool things with your mates. Uh, we're talking about the Kia Team of the Year Award. And again, the alignment between sponsor and category is bang on, with customers treated as though they are truly one of the team. To announce our nominees and present the award from Kia, Daniel Bond. Good evening. Um, there is no I in team, but there is an I in care. That's all that matters. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> right glasses, Thomas. On behalf of South and Kia, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate all of tonight's finalists and those who are lucky enough to be category winners. It's great to see the South and sports community represented across the room. Another great list of finalists in the Southland Kia Team of the Year category. And also, like many businesses, we've faced our challenges, would you agree? Over the last 12 months. But it's also been heartening to see the way the community has come together and support each other. And we are committed to continuing our support of Southland sports community. And the finalists for the Southland Kia Team of the Year are... While they won 10 medals between them at the National Track Cycling Champs, Magnus Jameson and George Manson showed true grit to take out the under-17 men's team sprint. They broke the national record in qualifying, only to be overtaken by Waikato before setting a new national and championship record in the final. Flying to success, Magnus Jameson and George Manson. After winning the Donald Gray title the previous year, Queen's Park went back to back for the first time in the club's 64-year history with an unbeaten local season in 2021, adding the Larry O'Rourke Challenge Cup and Charity Cup to the trophy cabinet in the process. A history-making season for the Queen's Park senior men's football team. Competing at the National Gymnastics Champs in July, dedication of the Invercargill Gymnastics Club senior women's artistic team was rewarded with three silver and three bronze medals. The team has been a dominant force at provincial competitions across the South Island and still have a lot of potential for the future. Always nailing the landing, the Invercargill Women's Artistic Gymnastics Team. Many pundits believe the Southern Steel would be an also ran in 2021 after losing co-captain Gina Crampton in the off-season and with five players under the age of 21, the Steel surprised the doubters by finishing the season on the same competition points as eventual champions, the Mystics, falling just short in the elimination final. Thrilling stuff from the Southern Steel. Nervous. <clears throat> And the winner of the the winner of the 2022 Southland Care Team of the Year is 
Magnus Jameson and George Manson. So two certificates, you know, one, one trophy, and two acceptance speeches. Yeah. Righto, so ten medals between you. Ha, ha, let's do the tallies. Who got, who got more? Um, I think I did. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. That's great. So, mate, you get to talk for longer. Oh, how now, fun. Magnus or George? Let's, let's, let's come clear, clean. Which one are you? <laughs> this shouldn't be a hard question. Me? All right, <laughs> there we are. Yeah, so you, which one are you? You're, which, what's am, your name? I'm so Magnus. I should have I'll framed that slightly yeah. differently. Come forward, Magnus. Come up the front here with me, mate. So, uh, so well done, mate. So talk us through that, uh, that, uh, that, those, uh, that effort up there, eh? That was something else? Yeah, it was great. Um, it was mainly just having fun for me and George, really, and doing what we'd love to do and just, yeah, having a lot of fun riding our bikes. So what did you win all your medals on? Talk us through, um, talk us through the tally. Three of mine were team events, one gold, which was in the team sprint, one silver in the Madison and one bronze in the team pursuit. Yep. And then the rest were individual ones. Right, good stuff. So now the under-17, this is what you've won it for, of course, the, the team sprints, so the two of you guys. So tell us, talk us through that event. Firstly, qualifying, uh, you know, and obviously you go out there and set a national record. I mean, you yeah. must have felt pretty good about that before you got tipped up. Someone went faster than you. Yeah, honestly, you had no idea when we um, actually got in. Uh, someone came up to us and said, well, came up to me and said, oh, you got the national record. So I was like, yeah. that was a bit of a surprise. And then in the final, it was um, just great to go out and ride and end up breaking the New Zealand record, which was a lot big surprise. So, yeah. Good work. So you qualify for the gold medal. George, let's bring you in uh, to it. You can talk us through the gold medal ride. Tell us about that, because you were actually, so you qualified second? Yep. So what did you think going into it? Change anything or you just go hell for leather, you know, out of the blocks? Go for gold, basically. Yeah, go for gold, mate. <laughs> so, and did it go all right? How did you talk us through the ride? Because you, you well, li literally lowered the national record in the final. The, when we first got in the starting blocks, the other team actually false started. Ah. So that kind of threw us a little bit, I suppose. So we just sort of reset and get back to it. But other than that, it was good. And you blitzed them? Was it close? Talk us through the, how did it finish? Um, yeah, it was fairly close, but then we won, so... Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Quite of the night. Now we won. <laughs> right, so what happens next? Do you go up to under 19? So you're still in under 17? So what's the plan? Uh, we go to under 19s in December for the Southern Champs. Yes, yeah, sweet. Yeah. Okay, nice. And then the schedule, the schedule going forward, you'll try and keep this thing going, will you? Yep, nationals next year. Yep. So you have to, do you, don't you have to, do you, at 19s, do you have to find another uh, mate? you have to ride as a three? Yes. Okay, so someone's going to have to ride longer. Yep. Like a whole extra layer. Yeah. Well, well done, boys. You've actually you've done a good job. Haven't they done well? Hey. Thank you. Thank the, you, uh, Daniel. Key yourself and team of the year. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, huge congratulations, you guys. That's amazing. I was worried that name question was yeah. just a bit complicated. I'm sorry like, about that. Don't start so hard. I maybe next wasn't time. as clear as I could have been with that question. I, I'm sorry. That's on me. Be more direct, Nick. Me? Be more direct. Okay, all right, let's get this back on track. It is time for our final Active Southland Services to Sport Award now. Another long-standing servant of their sport is about to be recognised. Dun, dun, dun. And to present this fourth award from the Active Southland Board, please welcome with me, Nigel Finnerty. Our final Active Southland Services to Sport recipient has been at the forefront of his beloved code for longer than most people can remember, although he has also had a significant involvement across just about every aspect of Southland sport over the years. He's been the driver, or should we say jockey, for his club's marquee event for the past decade, a 10-month undertaking which involves working alongside the police, local authorities, security, subcontractors and the thousands of people who eagerly look forward to this event. 
Ed, in the uh, challenges presented by the pandemic, we've all heard uh, about, of course, and you uh, realise that this is no small undertaking. Christmas at the races has become an event that is uh, now a must-do on the Southland social calendar, as well as sporting calendar, and there's no doubt that it and the thoroughbred uh, racing in Southland would not be the same without the final Active Southland Services to Sport recipient for 2022, Sean Bellew. <laughs> G'day, Shawnee. G'day, Ange. How are you doing? Well, I just thought I was a pig in a trough tonight. But, uh, <laughs> I saw a, um, a fair few of my crew here, so I thought something's up. <laughs> did you suspect, did you? Well, I did sort of, <laughs> sort of have an inkling. Hey, now, in that little brief that I just read, it said for longer than anyone can remember, how long has it been? Well, when I started life, there was one jockey lived in my body, now there's two, so... <laughs> <laughs> As you, as you can see, it's quite some time. <laughs> there, this is just what you do. This, you live and breathe this. It's in the blood, isn't it? So it's a family thing you've taken on. Where did it all start? Well, it's a drug of choice, actually. Um, I lived in a dead-end street, and uh, when I went down to the end of the street, there was three or four horses tied up to a fence, and there was no riders, and they were all in the bushes with my older brothers. So I started riding their horses, and uh, that got me to the racing game. I don't want to know what they were doing in the bushes. Nobody does. I only rode the horses. Nobody does. <laughs> All right, so you have been in it for you know, a, a short amount of time, uh, shall we say. Biggest changes that you've seen over your career? Oh, I mean, it's just the world's changing, it's evolving. And um, for what we've done this year, we were the only um, organisation that uh, held an event over a 1,000 persons, people, in the sign inside a pandemic year. We run to the gaps, so though. We felt that um, the December date was a really good one, and we knew that politically uh, the country had to be on the right foot at that time because everybody wanted to celebrate Christmas. And so we never backed off and we never doubted ourselves. And uh, we took the tea off cart and we got can, and uh, and it's just that can do attitude. And well, we, we knocked the bastard out of the park. Yeah, you did. Who went to it last year, by the way? Yeah, a few years. It was 4,000 of you, yeah. you miserable pricks, didn't you go? <laughs> I can tell you it's the 10th of December this year. <laughs> so you better be there by the sounds of things. All right, now there's always something up this guy's sleep. We know this. He is an innovator, he is a forward thinker. Any clues as to how it's going to look this year? Oh, look, it's going better. We just sort of. We've sort of undervalued the product that, that was supplied to the community uh, and we've got a, a first-rate facility now at Ascot Park. You know, Warren, the caretaker's here. He's not a caretaker, he's a course manager in the committee. They do a wonderful job. And it's just about bringing better to the market and uh, we've got to understand what the market wants and what the market needs. And so we're opening up things a lot more this year. We're going to have an open menu we're, uh, with, with um, dining and, and, and product. Uh, and it's a social event of the year. I mean, the reality is that we've got an economic um, obligation to the city because this 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 is revenue gathering and and creating uh, event that we run. And so, really proud to be part of it. Um, thank everybody to be part of it. And my organisation, my people, my wife. You know, without them, we can't do what we do. Somebody's connected in. Shawnee, it's always a pleasure. Well done, you. Congratulations. Have a great night. You can relax now and celebrate. Thank you, Anne. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our fourth Active Southland Services to Sport Award recipient, Mr. Sean Ballew. Ah, uh, good stuff. Well done, mate. Certainly a uh, lifetime commitment, no question about that. He was a dollar two uh, favourite with the bookies, and he's come charging home to uh, pick up a uh, active South and Services to Sport Award. Fantastic stuff. All right, uh, we'll uh, move on. Dessert is pending, but uh, we do have the uh, South and Times 
People's Choice uh, Award to dish out uh, with the unsung heroes that we have been uh, showcasing. Of course, they're up for uh, public vote over uh, recent weeks, and certainly the public have had a lot to uh, think about. Andrea Begg of uh, Central South and College, Sean Fitzgibbon for cricket, Mountain Vikings, William Impelmans, and the Nightcaps uh, golf team. How about you give them all uh, another round of applause, folks? They certainly all exemplify what lies in the heart of uh, not just our sporting bodies, but also at the uh, centre of our uh, communities as well. I could not agree more, Nick. And it's the reason that we're successful on so many levels. To present this award tonight, it is a great pleasure to welcome from the Southern Times staff, Catherine Matthews. Hello. I'm extremely nervous. Um, I only just started uh, as the sales manager at the South and Times a week ago. So <laughs> it's a bit nerve-wracking, first task um, to do this. And I am not the best at public speaking, speaking so it will be short and sweet. Um, I'm extremely proud, though, to stand before you all tonight and present the 2022 South and Times Unsung Hero Award. This award recognises one individual's outstanding dedication to their sport or sports. This year's finalists were nothing short of incredible individuals, and even though there can only be one winner, all four are tremendous Southland sports figures in their own right. I'm now pleased to announce, with over a thousand votes, our 2022 Southland Times Unsung Hero Award goes to William. Applemans. So, of course, we've uh, got uh, the late William's uh, widow Amy with us uh, here. How special is this for Will? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the nomination, um, for the votes. Yeah, it means a lot. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about, you know, he said he did it without your knowledge, half of the work he did up there too. Uh, but, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that and, and I guess just the, just the man hours that he put into that place and what it meant to him. Yeah, um, Will was very committed to um, keeping the bike tracks going. Um, when I couldn't find him at all during lockdown, I knew that if I went for a walk um, and listened for the whippersnipper, um, I'd find Will. Um, and he would be there from morning to night every day. And I knew if I got home from work and Will or the dog wasn't at home, um, he'd also be out the buff bike track. Um, yeah, he was just really passionate about it. And I'd just like to thank everyone for acknowledging his Effort, so thank you. Jeez. Good stuff, Amy. Well done. Congratulations. How about you put your hands together for Amy and the late William Implements? A truly deserving winner and a great choice by the readers of stuff in the South and Times. Well done, everyone. Um, probably due for a short break. Let's have some dessert, maybe. Yes, maybe let's do that. We, of course, have got two awards uh, still to come. Uh, the Vodafone Junior Sportsperson and ILT Senior Sportsperson of the Year Award. So enjoy dessert, and then we'll be back on the other side of that to finish off the evening.